This is Duke University. I want to, if performance is our, is our theme for today, ritual and sport are two ways into performance and the politics of performance. And ritual, which Ronald Grimes is talking about, kind of a time-honored way of thinking about um, performance, and it's very classic terrain for my home discipline of anthropology as well as for religious studies um, and others. And so here we have this foundational Durkheim and Mary Douglas and Victor Turner, um, really useful ways of thinking about ritual. Um, ways which, as many, many people have said for many decades now, have tended not to have a lot of history and politics and movement and contestation in them. Um, one of the things that Ronald is trying to do is to invite us to think both with but also beyond some of the classic texts and ways of thinking about ritual. And so in his paper, I can't remember if he mentioned this, here he has the idea of ritual creativity, namely the idea that rituals are always changing and getting invented and being forgotten, um, something that there's really not a place for ritual creativity in, in Turner or Douglas for all of their um, usefulness. And, um, and the film that he showed us, which is, which is very beautiful, uh, you know, gives us, is, is an example, it's, or is a document of, uh, of ritual creativity in the sense that you have this ritual that's bringing together these uh, Moroccan immigrants uh, with these First Nations people around in this kind of beautiful, made up, hybrid um, ceremony. So this is sort of ritual creativity in action. Um, I think it's interesting that the First Nations people are called upon or volunteer to do the part of the, the, the ritualizing and, you know, for all the way, ways that things change, there's still kind of the noble savage slot and, you know, a, a kind of wounded West that always needs to look to the other and to the native to find the marks that will, the, the way that, that to, to, to save itself from itself, to heal those injuries. And it's a slot that native peoples have sometimes, you know, like they make money and are into shamanism and stuff, but the whole kind of like new age tourism and, you know, weekend medicine man thing and stuff where, you know, often white people, but also African-Americans kind of go to the slot of the native to heal themselves and to, to do repair is enacted all over again here. You know, why not the, it's interesting, we know why not the, you know, the Jews having the Mohawk over to do the Jewish ritual. Why, why this combination? Um, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that it's, it's interesting to think of the kind of cultural politics um, involved there. Um, uh, Ronald also talks in his paper about ritual critique and the way that, you know, ritual is never a script, but always something that people follow and yet also do their own things with. And there's that one moment in the in the video where the little girl yawns, and uh, you know rituals are often boring, and that's and boredom is a is a form of of um, is a form of critique. So I think that that um, that but that she will also um, I think having this film will be will be something really special for her. Um, and in general, and Ronald, I don't have thinking about ritual. Um, and Ronald does more with this with his paper. Now, one of the obvious questions is sort of what about the human is not ritualized and where do we, does the ritual, is there really a space of the ritual as opposed to the space of the everyday? I mean, the everyday is made up of one ritual after another. Uh, my wife and I now in our coffee making in, in the morning have elaborated this, this highly ritualized script of what cups are to be used and what the temperature and isn't ritual about repeated specified actions at particular points in time that um, create larger meaning in this case waking us up uh, so and certainly academic conference and, and we and we, we we think of ritual as the space of the religious and the, the and the um, and not the space of the secular and yet what's more ritualized than all of this. So, um, so I think there's this invitation that, that Ronald makes in his paper to uh, let ritual off the leash and to see the ritual everywhere. And then, but does that end up evacuating the concept itself or not? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, 
Stephen's paper was much more, is really, if you read it, and it's a wonderful paper, is about sports in particular. So I want to talk a little bit about sport. Um, and so if ritual is a, is, a, is a classic academic way of getting into thinking about performance, sport is something that's had, sports studies is, a, is, a, is, a, is an outlier endeavor in the academy. And Know, for, for all kinds of reasons. I think it has to do a lot with, you know, there's very, in every department, there's one you know, person who, who's like me, who wrote a book about Tiger Woods, and, you know, and then it's, it's not, and it's really this way in almost all of the disciplines, sociology and history, maybe a little bit less so. And that I think obviously has to do with kind of cultural and disciplinary imagination, mind and body, jock and nerd were in the academy about mind about about the mind and about nerdness and we were the kids who were picked last in the playground dodgeball game and we'll be damned if we're going to spend our academic <laughs> careers studying sports that's what we you know, we're trying to get away from so i you know sports in general are i think this just a gigantic part of our world and yet don't get a corresponding kind of attention in the academy and i think maybe that's a good thing we have enough um sports already all around us. And, and in fact, this gets me to what, what the, the argument that Stephen makes in his, um, in his, in his paper. And um, what he, he uses the word mundophagic, uh, world consuming to talk about sports. He talks about the inner imperialism of sport. And here he's implicitly, I mean, I don't know how he would frame this himself, but in the work that we have in playing sports studies, there's often this idea that that play and sports reflect or refract the tensions of society. So CLR James famously in Beyond a Boundary says, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And his point is, well, to understand cricket, you need to understand the history of colonialism and the British who brought cricket to Trinidad and race relations and hierarchy and institutionality in a, in a complex Trinidad. And so in sports studies, we've tended to uh, like our, our move has always been to say, hey, look, sports refracts politics of race and of money and of capitalism and of masculinity and technologies of the body and performativity and so forth. But Stephen's paper a bit turns this upside down to argue that actually it, sports isn't a reflection or a fraction of some things. Sports makes and, and wants to consume our world in this, in this mundophagic um, mundophagic way. And when you think about this, both as a kind of empirical, but also on an epistemological claim, it, it, it makes a lot of sense in some ways. I mean, look where we, you two have escaped this just arriving last, but you know, we're in the middle of March madness here. And, and, and it's, and if the world is not being eaten up by sports and college basketball, you know, it certainly feels that way. Uh, and, uh, and part of the peculiarity of sport which, which Stephen notes, is that on the one hand, it's become more and more enclosed within particular spaces and arenas. We no longer, that old, you know, the kid, oh, this is kind of my childhood fantasies of the 1960s, you know, early 1960s, is you'd wait outside the locker room door for a famous baseball player and, oh, Mr. Mays, would you sign my... That doesn't happen anymore. The athletes and are, are cordoned off in these spaces. They have their entourage, they have their agents, and there's this, 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 this in operation of enclosure. Even at the same time, sports have this deeply kind of encompassing imperial kind of character. And really, you know, I, I know for people, which I'm sure is a number of you, if not uh, here, you know, to be a non-sports fan has, has really become difficult in this society because you can't go anywhere without, it's colonized our speech, it's, you know, wins and losses and strat and, it, and it's, co it's, it's colonized our, our entertainment, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, so um, one of the claims that, or the line that Steve explores in his paper is, you know, what would happen if we took sport not as a reflection of something, but as really an embodiment, a, a perfect allegory of the invention of modernity itself. And so if in a kind of classic Foucauldian fashion, the 1800s are about 
bureaucracy and expertise and surveillance and control and regulation. That's all what sports are about. And in precisely in the 1800s is when, you know, war, wars turn into things that are fought by armies. Education is located into schools, disease and medicine into the clinic. And games are turned into sports in the 19th century in the same way they're instant. All of the rules and regulations and, and lead, all of that is invented in the 1800s, much in, 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 this, in the set of disciplinary and kind of political, historical, sociological transformations that are happening in early modernity or whatever you want to call the 1800s. Um, and you can also argue that now, and I call it a late modernity, that sports embody uh, um, are the perfect allegory for a kind of, let's not call it post-human, I gather from the morning session, but post-human, cyborg, anthropogenic world, where a world where the boundary between the, between the human and the non-human has been increasingly breached by digitalization and genetic engineering and all the rest. Um, a world in which care of the self was the, 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 the late Foucault uh, aesthetic is so much a part of, of, of daily experience and practice. And also a world still certainly of, of, one of I don't like the word neoliberal, but kind of neoliberal capitalism and of a winner take all society and of things structured by profit. Uh, all of this is what sports is about. I mean, the technology and the cyborg body is the body of the LeBron James or the Lionel Messi was given growth hormones when he was a kid. Uh -huh. Care of the self is all, you know, what is sport but not a form of, uh, of care of the self, a kind of immunological practice to, um, to borrow, I guess, from, from, from Slaughter Dyke. Uh, and certainly when you go to the gym, I mean, how much time do all of us spend in the gym or the the, the uh, re-regulating, taking care of that, did this kind of internalized discipline um, in, in early 21st century life. And that's all what, what, what sports is about. And certainly kind of neoliberalism and capitalism, sports is about the aesthetic. It formalizes and aestheticizes the idea of competition, of, uh, of, of a society that's structured around, um, around winners and losers. So... There's much more to be said. I think I'll stop there. The, um, I wonder whether actually, I, I, I love what Ronald and what Steve are doing. I wonder, probably neither of them would want to make these big claims either, what, you know, what kind of legs either ritual or sport has have as ways of thinking about performance. I feel like ritual still, for, for all of the wonderful work that's been done about it, still has a kind of baggage that makes it a... Um, an unhip concept in the contemporary academy for better or, better or maybe for worse. Um, and sport, I think, is destined to remain this marginal thing that a few of us do, even if maybe more of us should or shouldn't. Thanks. <laughs> so we, can we begin with uh, questions for our panelists? Yes. None of these topics are really marginal. I mean, going back to the morning, the, uh, the notion of dance or the notion of theater or the notion of sport uh, may not be centerpiece in the university, but they are part of, of the larger society in a way that uh, is not canonical academically, but is still recognized universally by most people. It just happens to be outside the elite universities that, which we sometimes claim we're one. But one of the things that struck me as a kind of general comment for this session, I, I, I have a specific comment very briefly that I want to make um, to Ron, but I want to say something for, for uh, in general. The um, The most powerful book I've read in the last three years is by an Ethiopian Jew with a PhD from Oxford called Yuval Harari. And the book is called Sapiens. And then he says basically, <clears throat> religion involves two intersecting circles, the first of which is sport. Sport is the beginning of everything, a ritual, religion, etc. And then he says you have this other thing which is developed called relativity where we don't even know where we are in the universe. So sport is where we're on play and relativity is where we're beyond play. And those three trajectories in the Middle East says there are all kinds of religions, but there are only three that really count. The first is Islam, because they really think there is a God. Then there's Buddhism, which knows there's no God. And then there's communism, which says it's all matter. <clears throat> now, it's a really elegant, simplistic argument, 
but I somehow find it compelling to, rem to, re to uh, remember it and uh, introduce it here because it suggests that, in one sense, um, Sapiens, by the way, the conclusion of his 600-page uh, book is, Sapiens is a misnomer. We really don't know where we're going. We don't know how to regulate ourselves, either in sports <coughs> or uh, in science uh, or even in dance and theater. But, it's a, but the, the curious argument is that we're always testing borders and we sometimes don't recognize how and when and why we cross them. So I just wondered if, you know, it's the wrong university, it's Oxford, not Cambridge, but it's still a good degree and an interesting book. Uh, <laughs> and I w wonder how both, you know, both Orrin and Stephen respond to it. And what I, the other question I had that was really directly about uh, this fantastic uh, film, which I, um, you know, still can't quite believe all the images are there. The image for me was not only the kid yawning, the girl yawning, uh, Alia yawning, but um, the scene of the pagoda with the leaves with holes in them. So it was like this perfect nature and this is the window showing how imperfect it was. So I, I don't know if that was intended, but that's what I saw. Uh, the larger question is that only in Canada, I don't even think in the United States, could you have a Jewish, Muslim, immigrant couple um, that has, and this is nobody else I think would remark, maybe Solomon, nobody else would remark, it's not just that there were first Indian people, first native people who came to perform the service, but the in-laws of the religion which she had left, also came to it. The, all those credits at the back, at the bottom, which said paternal, maternal. So you remember that she was a Muslim who became a Jew in order for them to be married. But her Muslim relatives came to the First Nation funeral. I, I'm speechless. I, I couldn't imagine this happening anywhere else except Canada. So I wanted if Ron could comment on that. <laughs> Well, I couldn't imagine it happening even in Canada, even though I was there shooting it. So, uh, so you're you're quite right. I don't know whether that would happen any any other place. Uh, I've thought I don't know whether this project will go on. It may go on, uh, and I know some stories about their wedding. So there's lots of trouble behind the scenes you see here. There, there, there was trouble about the. At, uh, the wedding, there was trouble about the funeral. This is not the funeral, this is three months afterwards. Uh, there was trouble about this event. So there's lots of, tr there's lots of trouble, uh, but you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of remarkable scene. And I, but I keep doing the same thing that you're doing, going, wow, this really happened, and how, how did this happen? So, so uh, and I only know part of the story. I don't. I don't actually know this family. I, I know them through an intermediary. So, but I may, in fact, go back and pursue it. Um, this is a question um, to Stephen. Um, I was surprised by where you landed at the end, and I wonder if you could just expand and revisit it. Where you landed saying that um, sports as play was uh, um, um, holds violence at bay, and I can think of. Uh, numerous examples where, in fact, uh, sports as play um, produces violence. Uh, an immediate example would be uh, the kind of domestic violence produced um, uh, around uh, American football culture, for instance. Um, and there are many others. So can, can you just speak a little further about quite what you were getting at with that? Yeah, I think, I think there are lots and lots of examples. Vaccines are, another, are, are a very good parallel, once again, that I mentioned a little bit early on. Um, people know the victims of vaccines. They're very conspicuous. Um, it's very hard to measure in the same way the effects of the deterrence of disease. I mean, we know you can't see the people who haven't got the disease. They're just people who haven't got the disease. Um, the people who suffer from the vaccine, and there are always some who are sacrificed, are part of the kind of trade-off. It's not an exact thing because I think that there are sports that are, you know, disgracefully violent. Although oddly enough, the most violent sports are the ones that are the most formalized. In Britain, uh, football, our football, soccer is the most violent sport, and yet it's become almost a non-contact sport nowadays. It's so it's so balletic and so full of display and simulation. Whereas the most violent sport, our rugby. Um, it's to do with class things, but not just to do with class things. So I think there is an interesting question about really the distribution 
and whether the role of sport might not in fact be to put violence on display of a certain kind, of a certain kind of mm, containable kind, to protect us, this would be a Girardian argument, to protect us through a kind of scapegoat principle uh, against that absolutely uncontrollable violence that we are more and more capable of. I mean, the violence of, of, of mass extermination on unimaginable scales. And those are probably the stakes. Rather more domestically, um, I would want to say that, you know, sport is like a lot of other uh, ludicatory uh, functions. And it, I would certainly include academic life in that. Derrida says rather wonderfully and, and, and very surprisingly at one point, language is a means of diffusing urgency. And we do a lot of that in academic life. And that's what, that's, a, but this is very important. I mean, we get very, very het up about things that we feel and we want to persuade people are really important and that we are the legislators of and we need to be listened to. Actually, what we mostly do doesn't matter and we do it in such a way that it doesn't matter. And that's very important. Uh, it's, like, it's like the argument about, you know, I don't know if this is a sentimental reading of uh, the formation of the English parliament, but this does follow upon the extraordinary trauma, there are very few things that actually deserve to be called traumas in the world as opposed to minor inconveniences, but the Civil War was not a minor inconvenience, and there are some who would want to say it, it was still the most destructive uh, of civil wars. One in ten people in Britain died during the Civil War in the 17th century. Something had to come about that would allow people to loathe each other in the way in which um, Protestants and Catholics and then you know, the political forms that those migrated into, Tories and Whigs, people could loathe each other without killing each other. And the answer is Parliament, where you talk purposelessly for as long as possible. So procrastination as, as the principle of ludication uh, is, is fundamentally, I think, what we're involved in. And it's a very, very important, and I mean, I'm both joking and deeply serious about this. It's a way of making things unimportant. Um, reversibility, think of that, think of sport. In, in medieval football games, there was only ever one score, one nothing. You scored a goal, that was it. It was a bit like, it was a bit like uh, boxing, you know, in, up until the beginning of the 19th century. You beat somebody to an absolute pulp. Now we have half time. We change ends, we change round. If you lose 3-0, you play them again. Reversibility, sport, that's not, that doesn't happen in life. <laughs> you never get a second service in life. But, oh, I can get over the net, second service. You know, that's the space of sport, which I think is that space of opening up um, of, of distraction. It doesn't, I wonder just to, the, I mean, vaccines, most of us believe work. And, kids do mm, the polio. Mm. Whereas, with, I mean, just if you look at it empirically, the rise of sport in the 19th century doesn't go along with any lessening of the harm inflicted by human beings on other human beings. I mean, our the United States right now is probably the most sports crazed society in the history of the world. And yet we're, we've been waging wars and busy killing each other. Mm. And so I, I don't... Not the wars we could have been waging. Yeah. Not the wars that it was assumed. I mean, it's appalling, and we're quite right to get het up about it. But, you know, we're really het up about terrorism. Statistically, terrorism scarcely even exists. I mean, the numbers of people, even if you count the numbers of people being slaughtered by the particular groups we're really worried about, these are so tiny. We don't care about deaths on the road. 18,000 a year in the US, I believe. Six World Trade Centers every year, it's fine. You know, it's the, that's the price we pay. Um, so statistically, the things that worry us, the things that, there's a lot of slaughter around because there's a lot of media around. We see it all. A lot of it is produced for media. I, ISIS understand that perfectly well, the link between, between terror and media and, and violence. But actually, actually, and this is the version of the Stephen Pinker view, if you do the count, and it's a grotesque count to do, maybe we're doing one hell of a lot better that given our armaments and our, and our powers of destruction than we have any right to be doing.
your remarks are so uh, provocative. I mean, they really open up a lot. There are a lot of questions, <laughs> perhaps because of the things that you're saying. And I'm, I'm very interested in um, the formulation, formulation of violence in sports and perhaps also in the rituals around the memorial that you were giving us in the film. Um, kind of, especially now, what about the soccer in, in England? You, you push the violence out into the stands, into the audience, and it kind of leaks out of the contained uh, violence in the field. Maybe I'm overreading it. But then you, what do you do with that level of violence that is released or unleashed um, among the players? And I wondered in similar ways, perhaps, or maybe you can explain it better, um, was there a violence of the world that was somehow contained in the memorial service, the, the, the antagonism between the groups? Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of seeing the ritual and performance as both a way of um, modulating it in a productive and an unproductive way. I don't know, because you can see also, I mean, you were talking about terrorism, and we just saw today that there were three people executed and a couple stoned to death um, in a ritual, ritualized, violent act. Can you help me make sense of that? Help but us three make people, sense of that? Um, around, I guess you've been speaking for maybe two minutes, so that's four people died on the roads. As you spoke. Uh, well, but I don't, we don't mean care to. about yeah. this because we don't see them. But that happens every every second, every 25 seconds, somebody is slaughtered on the roads. That That's systematic. We do that. We do that systematically. Um, we, but actually, it's mm -hmm. part of a it's part of a calculus. You know, so I, I'm not worried about numbers. That's and, the and I, we don't want to see it. Yeah, I, I'm not really concerned about demographics or population control and things like that. I'm, I'm really more interested in the larger emotional and uh, moral, perhaps, I don't know, regulation that's being involved. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the questions that I had after, after <clears throat> this ceremony, uh, and even more so after editing this film, had to do with the performance of gentleness. Because people, people said afterwards, stunning, stunning gentleness. And these are people who don't, who don't even know what the symbols are about. They don't know about the combing with a, a bone comb. They don't know about pure water. They don't know about the feather. They don't know the stories of these. Although Francis tells, if you look at the other versions, you'll hear Francis giving little ex explanations. But the thing that was remarkable afterwards uh, was the sense of carried away gentleness. Now, the question, if you're, if you're <clears throat> serious about ethnography, is, well, how far does that reach? Does that just reach to the parking lot? Or does that reach to how, 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 how long do those images of the, of the comb going through the hair, how, how, long, how, how far down do those, those images seep? So I think it's interesting if you say the performance of violence inoculates us to say, well, what does the performance of gentleness do then? Does it also inoculate us, or does it evoke its opposite? Or, I mean, I don't know the answer, but I think it's an interesting question. My daughter is, is just about to finish a, a documentary film on women and gaming. And <clears throat> one of the workshops that she and I went to, because she needed an extra camera, uh, was called Boob Jam. And it was on breasts, and it was on uh, the way women's breasts are depicted in games. These are mostly women. But not all, a few men were there. And the premise was, well, women's breasts in games are always pointy and armored and so on and so on. Surely we can do something better. We can do something different. So they were, they were designing. These were young women learning to design games. Uh, so it was all about designing the nonviolent breasts. It's like, well, how do you do that? What are the images of that? And the first images that Kaylee and I saw on the screen when we walked in shocked us both. They were of breastless women who had had double mastectomies, and they were being tattooed. And, and I didn't know that this was going on. It just shows my ignorance. And I said, are you all making this up? And I said, no, this is, a, this is a practice. This is a practice. And I said, so what are you doing? And they said, well, we're trying to figure out how to turn this into a game. And they said, one of the women turned, she said, beats hell, beats hell out of blowing everybody away. And so they were trying. They were they were trying to create other 
images, and many of these images, you can bet, will show up in these violent in these violent games. But they are attempting to turn the tide, you know, sort of one body part at a time. Not to belabor the discussion of, of violence too much, but to, to add another layer that, of course, there's the violence as it's enacted on the field. And yes, football today, American football is very different from the medieval football, less violent. And then the violence that seeps out in you know, hooliganism, thuggery, right? But then there's also the, the larger structural violence, right, that, that happens in terms of exploitation of, of um, of athletes, right? You know, in boxing and African American men who, you know, box and what the kind of exploitation of that and or what's coming out, you know, nowadays with with concussions and helmets and and the men that that are suffering from this kind of structural deep structural violence and racism that is being perpetuated by by sports, I think. Is another layer of the of the violence. Yeah, are, they are there on display to be hurt. For us, and actually, I think many, many more people are hurt in sports now than were hurt in medieval football. It's just it's not violent because it's it's ordered, it's structured, it's you know, and it's kind of willing as well. You know, I mean, you 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 can in fact be arrested for breaking somebody's leg on the football field. I think that the law is the same in the states as in Britain that a that a policeman or woman can walk off the terraces and arrest the person because it's a crime. But actually, it's a protected space. It's a ritual space. So the question of what is violence is a bit like saying, well, is a lion violent? Well, no. Um, you, you know, violence is kind of positional in, in that sense. I do, I, I, I mean, I never said that sport is, uh, is absolutely the solution to violence, because in a certain sense, sport obviously is an intensification of violence. Um, but it is actually a field of technique for the production of less violent people, oddly enough. And, 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 and British football is a very good example of this because the, the disciplining, technologizing, civilizing, you might want to say, of sports crowds uh, is a major exercise in Britain. And indeed, it really works. It's made a fantastic difference. Uh, women and children go to football matches. Uh, they never used to go to football matches in the 1980s. Completely impossible to be anywhere near a football match. So uh, it doesn't always work. These immunological things are always risky. We know this because we're living in a, in a world of immune system crisis. They're always risky, but that's the logic. That's what I want to claim. That's actually the logic. Um, same on the violence thing. Um, Stephen, I think part of what you're trying to get at also is um, kind of the media attention that surrounds sports also kind of produces a sense that it's somehow more violent than, say, some other aspect of life, which doesn't necessarily seem to be a direct correlation, but yet there's an intensified focus on it. Um, but one question that leads me to is, in terms of what Katya was talking about, about like the structural violence of the athletes themselves, is if sports is intended, at least like through this product of, or project of modernity to immunize um, the society from violence, then yeah, what are the stakes for the actual athletes themselves? Not so much in terms of, what I was thinking wasn't so much in terms of structural violence enacted on the athletes, because I mean, that, I don't think that's very much different than working in a factory or you know, participating in life generally um, in a capitalist society, but um, more so like, um, I'm thinking of, somebody raised the, the question of like domestic violence. Um, so I'm thinking of if sports and athletes are this you know, nonviolent form or has come to be this nonviolent form um, of entertainment, then what are the stakes for the athletes themselves who then are like positioned to not, to be an athlete both on and off the field? So now domestic violence becomes something that is somehow wrapped up with their image as an athlete. So when you see an athlete like, let's say Ray Rice, which everyone knows, well, at least in America, everyone knows the incidents surrounding um, Ray Rice or, you know, let's throw Cantona's Kung Fu kick, and you know, it's, it becomes like hyper sensationalized in a way. So would you, would you, what would you say about um, the athlete kind of becoming this like ideal prototype of the nonviolent almost in a way that like they can't even enact or represent regular, like they can't really be regular people anymore in a way because at the point they act like normal people and do something like domestic violence, which I'm not obviously not condoning, but it's something that happens in all spheres of life. 
then what are the stakes for the athlete who, so it seems to me like all of these things are wrapped up in this kind of project of modernity, but yet we're in this, I don't like using the word that, like the world's in a postmodern moment, but we've kind of moved past this universalizing, universalizing notion of modernity. So what are, is there maybe a disjuncture between the original intention of sport as this you know, immunizing function and what we're now seeing um, with how athletes are represented, I guess. I don't want to say that sport is not, sport is not the agent. Sport is representative of the kind of ways in which we are attempting. There are many, many different ways. Uh, among them are, you know, endless reflection on, on violence and, and a kind of deterrence of the very idea of violence you know, through all kinds of social codes, sensitivities, uh, and inhibitions, quite rightly, quite rightly. We're, we are all of, we all of us learn to be much, much more self-inhibiting, quite right that we should. But this is the production of a particular kind of human that is becoming more and more universal. And I do think that sport is, 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 is partly instrumental in that, but is, but is mostly, uh, it's mostly a kind of an image of, our kind of, you know, increasingly universal um, uh, self-technologizing. We, we, I mean, the, I, the, the principal idea is actually the idea of training. We are all of us in moral training, just as we're in medical training, just as we're in athletic training, you know, and nowhere more so. I mean, we're, it's the most moralistic time that I can think of. We're more moralistic now than we've, we've ever been, and especially in the academic world. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but it is what we do. Thank you much. Uh, um, just quickly, the idea of um, ritual and rainmaking, it reminds me of Ceremony by Lesman Marmon Silko, um, the need to create new rituals to be adapted to new times across time and space um, for particular reasons in society. I was reading a um, history of Greek art and a piece from an amphora stuck with me. It was an Ethiopian who was doing a handstand on a bull and the Greeks were prostrated before him. And I was like, wow. You know, and it, um, I thought about it across time and space, and I was like, wow, if a guy, you know what I mean, gets a touchdown, you know, everybody gets up and does the wave, and they bow before him. And I was thinking about how, you know, we still go to sports and amphitheaters and coliseums and all this and the racial dynamics of it and whatnot. And I was wondering if um, you could, like, fuse the talks in such a way as to talk about the crypto-ritualist, adorationist, spiritualist, faculties of sports that may be going, you know, unrealized in post-modernity, but are actually ever present. I'm thinking about guys prostrating in the end zone, doing their special dances when they um, make touchdowns and stuff. Yeah, thanks. It's compelling. And I think the idea of the, uh, the specially accredited person or the specially gifted person uh, is something that rituals and sports and, and many professions also have. I was very interested by, I mean, the guy was just like kind of doing stuff that any of us could do, but there's a special sense in all rituals that you would need to be able to do the feather, you know, kind of just right. And actually, you do have to do it just right, because let's face it, the feather down your face is going to tickle, right? There's always got to be, there's always got to be something that can go a bit wrong in a ritual, a bit of high wire stuff, um, in order that there can, that the containing framework, the ritual and part of that containing framework is the person who is accredited with the power whether it's the sportsman or the I mean uh, I, I had a I had a Japanese student who studied with me in London for three years and he got his PhD and he was um, we were just saying goodbye he's going back to Tokyo I was saying keep in touch and well done fantastic he said there's something can, can I ask you something before I go I said yeah do you think I could call you Professor Connor because I'd said to him, oh, call me Steve, that's what we're doing, you know, and it had been Steve, and this guy, you know, wanted me to be the professor, wanted me to be the, what Lacan calls the, you know, the subject supposed to know. Uh, we all of us play that part and have to be willing to play that part. Um, it's very uncomfortable, I think, for sportsmen sometimes to be, and women to be regarded as, as deified, but they're, they're kind of 
doing work for us. And I, and I think that also gets over some of that sense of implied insult by, you know, okay, it's got to be a mohawk, somebody, you know, uh, uh, or there's got to be, you know, and, and in Australia, it's always indigenous people who have this special kind of wisdom, uh, you know, but we do this to each other a lot. That's part of what ritual involves. We have to agree to play the part that other people want us to pay. Otherwise, the thing isn't going to work. Yeah, I think if we, I don't think you need the crypto, so. <laughs> uh, sport is ritualized. Some sports are more ritualized than other sports. Everyday life is ritualized. This kind of makes Oren nervous, but <clears throat> if I said everyday life is dramatized, it wouldn't make anybody nervous. So I don't know why that would make us nervous to say. So it seems to me. Sport is ritualized. Sometimes it's more ritualized than at other times. At Olympics, it gets very high churchy. Uh, so I don't see I don't see any problem. So John McAloon, I think, who's thought a lot about this, doesn't doesn't set ritual and sport up as opposites. He talks about nest and nest the nesting of one genre and another. So that it seems to me that you can do that with sports. You could flip it the other way and say, okay. Where in ritual do we find sports and sporting events? And where do we find performance? And it's not very hard to start coming up with lots of examples where you get the one embedded in the other. So this, this nesting or this embedding seems to me absolutely persistent. It shows up everywhere. That's what started me on the track was I couldn't say this was ritual and that was not. I had to keep saying, well, look, you know, this looks like street theater. This looks like opera. This looks like civic pronouncement. It was all part of one event. Now, in Santa Fe, they didn't call it ritual. They called it fiesta. But all, these were all little baskets inside the big basket. Uh, so I, I gave up a long time ago fretting too much about all the definitional problems. And I learned to speak indigenous. So they said fiesta. I said fiesta. I, if I said ritual, well, they go, oh, that. Yeah, I think there's some of that. They do that in the cathedral. But I go to the cathedral, and they go, no, we don't do that. We do the liturgy. Right. <laughs> so I think you have to you you have to figure out who you're talking to and then adjust your terminology. So so I I, th I think uh, the short the short answer is rituals are nested inside of sports. Sports sometimes are nested inside of rituals, and there are a lot more other genres that are nested and subnested. So if you get serious about this, then you have to you have to look at this kind of nesting stuff. That's all. Thank you, everyone, very much. Panelists, thank you so much for your contributions today. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.